Amen. So we thank God for, for giving us just the gift of life today. Amen. We just, we just sang a song, uh, simple words, very simple words, and all we were just saying is Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. The Lamb of God is seated at the right hand of the Father. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy. Very simple words, but you know the problem with some of these worship songs, we sing and we sing, but we don't really understand what they're talking about. We don't really understand the meaning behind the song. You see, I believe some of these songs, these writers don't think about them themselves, but the Holy Spirit itself inspires some of those songs, just as it inspired the writing of the word. You see, this writer who sang this song knew something that we ourselves might not know at the moment. And I'm just hoping that at the end of today's service, you might know what it means to say that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. What does it mean that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father? What does it even mean that Jesus is the Lamb of God? That's my question. That was my question. That was my question. You see, reading the Bible more often now, I, I found out that it's all Christ-centered. It's all about Jesus. You see, the Old Testament is actually prophetic in, in a way that it shows the coming of Jesus and what he was to do. When we go to the New Testament, it's actually the same theme. It's all about Jesus. And you see, for the past months, I was just asking God, why is your word so centered on your son? Why? Why is it all about Jesus? Why is it all about Jesus? And God is faithful. God is faithful. He's been giving me all these messages from the book of Romans, the book of Hebrews, and the book of John about who Jesus is. The book of Hebrews, which I'm going to use today as my text, it's, it's like the author is talking and he's always trying to prove that Jesus is better than whatever you guys are thinking about. He was mainly writing to a Jewish population, those that didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So when he writes, he says, Jesus is better than the most that you guys speak so highly of. Jesus is better than Joshua that you guys speak highly of. Jesus is better than angels that you guys speak highly of. Jesus is better than the high priest that you guys speak of. Everything. It was just saying Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is this. Jesus is that. Jesus is this. And I'm, I'm, I'm just thankful that God has been, has been teaching me about who Jesus is and what his job was to do. Today, uh, it's going to mark the start of the series where I'm just going to be talking about Jesus, just to understand who Jesus is. And we're just going to go to the Word of God today. If you could just wave your Bibles in the air, just to, just to show that you do care and you do have your armor, you see. Amen. That's, that's, that's awesome, that's awesome. We all have our Bibles. If, if you don't have a Bible, Arthur's got a hotel, just go there, book a room. <laughs> The shelf on the right just opens. Still, yourself a Gideon. You see, you you need you need the word of God. You need the Bible. <laughs> if we're, today we're just gonna catch up with some Bible reading. If we haven't been doing much this week, we have got a lot of scriptures to cover today. If we're open from the Book of Luke, chapter chapter fifteen. Book of Luke chapter 15, if you found it, just say yeah. yeah. And if you're still looking, just say hold on. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't have your Bibles, if you haven't gone to Arthur's Hotel, we actually have it on screen for your enjoyment. Everyone has it? It says... Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. See, when I was reading this, I was like, Man, these guys actually have some logic behind these questions. If Jesus is the Son of God, the most righteous person there was at that time or ever, why does he hang out with bad people? Why does he hang out with the sinners? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they themselves do not even allow prostitutes, thieves, 
robbers, every, all the bad people will not come into the temple. It will never happen. No one will socialize with them because socializing with people like that will show that you approve of what they do and that you are part of what they do. But Jesus does the direct opposite of the Son of God because Jesus fulfilled every single thing that was written in their books that he, the Messiah was to come and do. But they had one problem and that was that Jesus was hanging out to sinners. And I had the same question too. Jesus, why do you hang out with bad people? Don't, why don't you spend time in the temple with people who love you, people who are seeking after you? Why? It's a very logical question. But I understood that the Pharisees missed a very vital point when they were reading the Torah, which is basically the first five books of the Bible. Because Genesis 3, which is the fall of man, Adam and Eve sinned. And the Bible says their eyes were opened. You see, they became conscious of the sin that they had done. And so they decided to run away and hide from God. And then God comes down. He says, Adam, Adam, where are you? That question was not asking because God didn't know where Adam was. He actually knew the physical location where they were. But God's questions are, are to ask you to look at yourself and see where exactly you are. You see, Jesus said, give me the water to drink to the Samaritan woman. It's not because he was thirsty, he couldn't drink water, but he wanted her to see that Jesus is actually the water that he needed. So this was one of those questions that God asked Adam, where are you? So Adam could look at himself and see just how distanced he was from God. From being a child of God who was always in communion with God to running and hiding away from God. That's where he was right now. So he says, Adam, where are you? And he notices this. And God does a crazy thing. You see, he says to the woman, he, he, he starts cursing the snake, and he starts cursing the woman, and he says, your seed, your seed shall bruise the head of the serpent. If you have done biology, you know that women don't have seed, but men have seed. So what is God talking about here? His word was actually prophetic. He was actually speaking about Jesus to come because Jesus was born by Mary, a woman, but Mary had not slept with her husband to give birth to Jesus. So that he was talking, that's what he was talking about before. And he does even a crazier thing. He kills an animal and then he clothes the same people that messed us up today. All the problems that we have is because of Adam and Eve that we have today. But God goes to the same people who messed all of us up. And he still clothes them after they've messed us up. That's illogical. Why? These are bad people, God. What are you doing? What are you doing, God? This is what these Pharisees didn't understand. That God was not just a God. He was a father. No matter what his child did, he still loved his child. And so already he had made a plan to bring back his child into communion when he says, your seed shall. He's talking about Jesus. So Jesus was to come and repair what his child had done wrong. So God still loved the child, but he had made a plan to change the child to become perfect again, which is amazing. You see, there were people in the church and they all gathered just like we do. It was testimony time. And the lady came and she stood up in front. She was new and she said, there's sin in this room. And she talked about every single person, what they were doing, including the pastor. And they all felt sorry and they, they, they started praying and asking God for forgiveness and they repented. The pastor couldn't even preach and they went home. Wednesday fellowship, the same thing happened. The same woman comes and she said, there is still sin in this church. She said the same thing that what these guys were doing, including the pastor. And fellowship couldn't carry on and then they all just repented and they left. It happened the third time, the fourth time. And then the fifth time there was a guy sitting at the back. So he stood up, he said, get out in the name of Jesus. And the woman fell down and she started rolling. And then they chased the demon out. And people were amazed. How, what do you mean? She told us all our sins. How, what do you mean this woman is possessed? How did you even know? And he says, this is not the God that we serve. God is not there to condemn us. God loves us. If God condemns us, we ourselves are going to die in our sin and stay in our sins. You see, and he said, go, guys, when you go back home, go and read Luke 15, which is what we're, we're going to read today. Amen. And we go to the next thing which I'm going to skip to chapter 11. 
when Jesus is telling one story, the few chapters that he skipped, Jesus was answering the question about why he hangs around with bad people, why he hangs around with sinners. And Jesus tells them a story about a shepherd who had hundred sheep, one went missing, and then Jesus went after that one sheep that had, um, that had um, lost its way. And to these people, this did not make sense. Like, I mean, even to us right now, if you look at it proper, if you had hundreds of uh, hondas, because sheep, no, we don't have sheep, we've got hondas. But if we had 100 hunters and we lost one, we just look at our garage, how we've got 99, we're good. But Jesus was actually talking about himself and the love that he has for those who are lost. That's he was right. trying to make them understand that, guys, it doesn't matter that these people have chosen to go out of the way and, right. and leave you guys who think yourselves are right. right. I will still go after them and leave you guys because you think you're okay, but I'm praying for those that are lost. The funny thing is, Jesus doesn't come with the, with, with the sheep in front of it, or he doesn't go in front of the sheep behind, he carries it on his shoulders. So, he brings it back. The sheep, the sheep doesn't go seeking after the shepherd, but the shepherd goes seeking after the sheep. What is this? Crazy, illogical love. It's unexplainable. It's unexplainable, but that's what love is. And he tells them another story. He said, for there was a woman with 10 silver coins. See, at the time, they probably held them around here, around their neck, and, and they were hiding inside their clothes so that no one would steal what they had. But she lost one. You think she's okay with nine? She flips everything in a room. The Bible says she tore everything apart looking for that one silver coin. But you've got nine. Why are you looking for one? It's the same thing. But now Jesus wasn't talking about himself as the shepherd. He was actually talking about the Holy Spirit and how it empowers the church to seek for those who are lost. Because in the church we've got a problem to say when someone comes in and they leave, it's okay, it's fine, we are still here. So we are okay. See, so we are reading our own different Bible if we're doing that. Because God doesn't do that. He goes after to seek. He flips everything that he has to find that one. God, you've got nine. No, I want that one, two to make them ten. Amen. But we are comfortable with us having these numbers when there are people who've come to our doors once and they never come back again. And we are cool with it. We are cool with it. It's okay. You guys can go. You can leave. It's your choice. What happened to getting saved? What happened to discipleship, people? What Bibles are we reading? What happened to the lost coin? What happened to the sheep? Selfishness, it's utter selfishness. Amen. Because if, if you're selfish, you don't love. That's right. If you're selfish, you don't love. You see, if I love you enough, I can share everything I have with me. I can even give you and choose not to have because I love you. Mm. That's the God that we serve. And God was challenging these people like, okay, you guys think you're righteous and you're always in the temples, you're saying all these prayers. And you've got all these sinners that you cast out of church and you think you guys are fine because you guys have each other. But that's not me. That's not the God that you guys serve. Because you guys serve a God that you don't know. That's why I'm telling you all these stories. And then he goes to speak of the Father, which is God. So he's spoken about Jesus. He's spoken of the Holy Spirit. And this is now talking about God. And the Bible says, and Jesus continued. He said, there was a man who had two sons. The young one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And notice it says, not long after, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country. And they squandered his world in wild living. We've got these two sons. You see, we have to look at it from a Jewish point of view to really understand what Jesus was talking about. We've got these two sons, and one says, well, the younger son actually, he says, Dad, well, Dad, I've been working for you all this long. Like, I've, I've been doing right all along. I'm tired of this. <laughs> Let me go party like those other guys that we see. Let me, let me go do what those other guys do so I can enjoy my life. Because you are just keeping me here surrounded in this little prison. But I want to go out and have fun. So he, he asks his dad. And, at this moment, and look at it this way. From a Jewish point of view, the fans who are listening to this are probably just about to stand up and walk out. Because there's no young son who would ever ask for such a thing. It was always the elder son who would leave and get his share after he gets married. One, he's the younger son. Two, he's not even married. He's got no right to ask for such a thing. But what does the father do? He says, okay. He shows us the free will of God. We all 
here I have free will. You see, I had, I had an argument with this guy because you're an atheist about free will. You see, and I told him this story and I told him even from the book of Genesis that God gave us free will from the start. You see, the Bible says the two trees were in the middle of the garden, which is, doesn't make sense because God, why would you put it in the middle? Of course we're going to see it. Of course we're going to focus on it. It's right in the middle of the garden. Put it at the edge and we don't have to worry about it. But you see, here's the thing. Love is not only proven by what you do, but it's also proven by what you don't do. Amen. So God is, gives them this free will that you guys can do whatever you want. Right? But also, to show me that you love me, I'm going to put these trees in the middle. I'm not going to force you guys to love me. Make your decisions by yourself. Because I love you. Amen. That's free will. We can't deny that God has given us free will to choose. Because most of us, when we sin, we say, Ah, oh, well, I didn't have a choice. No, we all have a choice. We just choose the wrong one. But we also show that we love God by the things that we don't do. Which is the whole reason why he put those trees in the middle of the garden. But let's just go on with the story. And he says, not long after. So I'm guessing this father, out of his oil estate, he divided it in half or a third or whatever it was. And then he probably sold it for a cheap price because his son wanted the money. Because there was no way he could have sold it in such a short time. So he probably sold it for way less than the actual price. He says, well, my son, since he wants this, I'll just give him. That's how much love he had for his son. He just couldn't say, no, okay, fine, we can do it. And he went to Vegas and he had so much fun with the people that he was gambling, he was sleeping with prostitutes, he went shopping on the high street, everything, everything. He did everything that he thought was fun. <laughs> but the, f the funniest thing happens, and he said, after he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. You see, notice that the famine wasn't caused by the Father. Okay, let me explain that. When we sin and something happens, we're like, ah, maybe God is because I sinned. That's why. I'll give you an example. If, if I had my child and he always wanted to play on the street, and I'm always telling him, well, Chris, don't go playing on the street. Like, you're going to get hit by a, by a car, right? Okay, fine. I tell him, and then I bring him back. And then he does the same thing, and I put him like, Chris, don't do that. I've been telling you all along. He does it the third time, and he gets hit by a truck. And then we go to a hospital, and his friends come over. He's like, oh, man, my dad's messed up, man. He's been telling me not to play on the road, and now he made me get hit by a truck. That's so messed up, man. But that's how we are. Yeah. It's funny, because we've put it out of context. But that's exactly how we do it. When something bad happens, oh, it's probably because I said, ah, God is messed up, man, God is messed up. We don't say it in those words, but our actions prove what, what is going on. But that's not God, because Jesus intentionally says, a family arose where he was, not even where his father was, where he was. So sometimes we blame God for the things he doesn't even do. You wait there and things happen and now you want to say, ah, God. But that's us. That's us. Don't worry, guys. I'm also speaking up for myself here. So don't, don't feel uncomfortable. It's a good message. <laughs> and it says, So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. This is now the end. These Jews cannot take it. A Jewish boy going to feed pigs? Of all things. No, no. You, you have to be joking. You have to be joking. But Jesus was showing them the death of their sins. Because we, we actually don't even realize how much we're doing when we're in it. Yeah. You see, it's only the people on the outside who say, well, even the father, even the father used to say, well, my son who has died is now back. Because this is just like dying, guys. You're feeding pigs. The most dirtiest animals you ever find, you're feeding pigs. <laughs> he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating are ah, even worse. <laughs> but no one gave him anything. You see, he didn't even have food, he didn't even have anything that he also desired the most rubbish food that these pigs were having. That's some of the messes that we ourselves get ourselves in. The worst things you could ever ask for, but we want them because we've, 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 we've run away from God and what he has to offer. We've run away from God, so what can we do? Let's just settle what we have. That's us. That's us. Jesus is talking about us. It's a funny story, guys. It's a funny story. And from verse 17 to 20, he says, uh, When he came to his senses, 
He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. He now realized, wow, man, my father's actually a gracious man, man. Dude, like, there's nowhere else that servants have like three meals a day, man. Like, it never happens anyway. It's only with my dad. You know what? I think I'm gonna go back, man. I can't stop here and die, man. Eh? Let me just go to my father. And this is what I'll say to him. Eh? And, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. So my sins, Father, are not only against you, but they are so high that even get to heaven. Mm -hmm. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And not just I just lying with the word worthy. Because a lot of us ask us this question, what am I worth? And if you ask a person that, if you go to Bill Gates and say, what are you worth? He'll tell you an amount in figures. And he says, well, I'm worth whatever billion. Why? Because I am the CEO of Microsoft. If we ask you, what are you worth? Well, I'm worth this much because I've got a degree in this. I'm worth this much because I've done this. You see, the world has trained us, it has taught us that whatever we get, we have to work for it. So, he says, I am not worthy, meaning I'm not, I don't deserve to be your son anymore. Yeah. When has the birthright ever been deserving in your life? Where? Where? Yeah. Where? Because when we sin, we can't pray. We're saying, God, oh, I, don't, I, I, I don't think I can pray because I'm not worthy to pray because I'm a sinner. Listen, birthright is not about worth. It's not about what you work to do because you were just born in that family. Right. Your name is Sija Mafulela because you were born in the Mafulela family. You did not choose, but you got your father's name because of the family that you were born in. We are born again Christians, meaning we are Christ's children. We don't work for that. It's not because we deserved it. It's not because anyone here deserved it. It's because of his love and his grace that he has made us his children. Go ahead and pray after you sin because God doesn't look at how deserving or worthy you are. He was never about that because he never put you there because you deserve it. He put you there because you're his child. He put you there because he's his child. Stop looking at your works of oh God. I've done this wrong. I've done this wrong. So I don't deserve. Worthy? What are you worth? What are you worth? What are you worth? Worth is not guaranteed by works, people. It's not guaranteed about what you do. It's not guaranteed about what you do. What you do does not even mean anything to God. It doesn't mean anything. The Bible says, for it is impossible to please God without faith. Only one thing pleases God. You see, you can say, for it is impossible for a car to move without fuel. So only one thing makes the car move, it's fuel. God is not pleased about your works. God is not pleased about what you have to do. He's not even looking at that. He's pleased in the faith that you have. Faith in who? Faith in His Son. Amen. What pleases God is His Son, not you. You could never, ever please God by your works. Your works are dirty. They are filthy. You could never do anything right for a day. Amen. And you still think God feels happy because of what you do. He's not pleased by that. He doesn't give you worth because of what you do. That would be unjust of God to do that because it's so unfair on you. You can't even spend a day without telling a lie. You can't spend a day without doing anything wrong and you still think, oh, I deserve to be a son of God. Come on. <laughs> I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, he hadn't even got there, but his father still saw him when he was still a long way off. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, hashtag that's crazy, threw his arms around him and he kissed him, hashtag even more crazy. This is his father. His son is coming back home. And notice the son doesn't walk halfway. He says, well, man, I can't do this. Let me go back. Even though he knows he has messed up his family, he has messed up his father, he has messed up his family's world, he still longs to say, well, I know my father will receive me. Even as a servant, I know my father will receive me because he's gracious. That's the mindset we ourselves need to be. We, don't, we shouldn't walk halfway to say, God, we're going back to you. And, and all of a sudden realize, well, we can't really do this. I think I should just go back. No. He kept on pressing to get to his father. And this was the amazing thing. You see, I normally don't cry, but when I was reading this, tears just came out. Why? 
He says, while he was still a long way off, you see, from the time he left until the time he came back, his father probably didn't even walk after that. He'd probably go up a hill and just look, maybe my son is coming back. Maybe he's coming back one day. That's why he says, while he was still far away off, his father ran. Meaning his father was actually looking out for him to come back. He was already waiting, even though he knew he had gone, maybe he was going to die. But his father's life actually stopped there because he loved his son. I don't care. I'm not going to do anything else until my son comes back. I'll just sit here on this mountain and look until he comes back. Son, please come back home. Son, please come back home. I don't care what you've done, my son. Please come back home. Come back home. At this time, their culture, as a man, you could not run. I'm sure most of you have seen some of the, 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 the Arabs wear their whole thing and, and it covers their toes. Because it's wrong for a man to show his legs. And this is the type of thing that they wore at this time. But he says he ran, meaning he probably pulled it up and started running to his son. He doesn't care what anyone else will say. He doesn't care that the world will say, well, God is illogical. People sin and he still runs to them like that. No, he doesn't care if he's going to disgrace himself or whatever it is. The father still runs to his son out of love, out of joy. My son is back. My son is back. My son is back. Nothing else mattered to him. His pride did not matter anything to him. What the, what the outsiders will see did not matter to him. But his son. But his son. That's the amount of love that God has. And he does even the craziest thing. He hugs his son. And he kisses him on top of that. I'm sure this boy is just open like, Dad, what the hell are you doing? Come on, man. Like, I, know you, I know you're happy, but like, I'm just confused. I've just messed up everything. God, yeah, you, you run to me, one. You hug me, two. You kiss me, two. Ah, I cannot accept this. This is, this is wrong. This is why we've got a lot of people who don't believe in the Christian faith. Because they don't think that there's a God who could love someone like that. No, it's illogical. It doesn't make sense. How is it possible that a spirit like this, a, a much larger thing, could come, create people, love them with such amazing love to the extent that when they do anything wrong, he's still willing to receive them. So people end up saying, no, this is a fairy tale. This could never happen in real life. So they never himself embrace Christianity. They never embrace God because they think this is ridiculous. It's not illogical. But God is illogical, crazy love that we can't explain ourselves. And Jesus says this intentionally, knowing what these Jews would be thinking, so that they will know this is the God that you guys serve, not the God that you guys continue to speak to yourselves about. And then the son goes on to say his speech that he had prepared. He said, says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer to be worthy to be your son. Remember, in the last part, he was going to say, oh, make me like the servant. But he didn't even finish. His father just cut him off. The father just says, hey, bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fat and cuff and kill it. Let's have a party. That's the love that the father had. He doesn't even care anything else. He cut him with the speech of this. You don't have to say anything to me. You don't have to say to me. I'm going to receive you anyway. So stop with the speech. And he gives him a robe to cover him, which was actually symbolic for the robe that Jesus himself was to give us when he dies. And then he gives them a ring, which at the time if you're writing a letter to seal the letter to say, I approve that I have written this, you'd use this ring and put on ink and then, and then dab the paper that you're going to send so they know it's definitely Mariam who wrote this letter. The father gives his son a ring to say, well, from now on, if you're going to do anything, you've got my ring, you've got my seal. Which is exactly what Jesus did when he came to give us the Holy Spirit. So now we've got the power to say, out in the name of Jesus. That's the ring. That's the ring he gave us. So he covered us one, two, he gave us the ring. <laughs> he gave us the ring. And he goes on to throw a party. <laughs> Which is something I didn't understand. God's grace is bigger than your mistakes. <laughs> Clearly we've just seen by what we've read. God's grace it's way bigger than your mistakes. You see, the church, most churches, they say, well, don't really preach about the grace of God. Don't really preach about the love of God. Because people will continue in sin. I don't know what Bible they're reading. Because Jesus shared this message for a reason. I'm sharing this message for a reason. I had, I had three hours of sleep today, and God was just speaking to me on this. And I was just so excited. I couldn't wait to come and share this message with you. 
God loves those people. God loves us. If there's anything else that we can be sure of today or any time in our life, it's God's love. Right. It's far greater than what we ourselves could imagine. The problem now is the kind of worldly love that we receive from other people. That's we try right. and, and put it into God. Oh, God probably loves me like my husband. God probably loves me like my dad. God probably loves me like my boyfriend. <laughs> no, it's not like that. There's, there's not a person who could ever give that kind of love. It's the love of the Father. It's the love of the Father. You see, I started putting this in my own life. You see, there are times when my father was just so angry with me. So, so angry with me. But there was never a day that he chased me out to say, well, I never want to see you again. Because no matter what I did, I was still his son. He had to keep me. He had to keep me. Where was he going to put me? You see, even if he tried to do that, a few days later, he said, oh, my son. But he is my son. He's part of me. He bears my image. He's part of me. The love of the Father. We could never understand it. We're just going to go to the book of Hebrews. If you could open to uh, Hebrews 10. Uh, verses 1 to 4, which comes the, which comes the theme of, of today's message, that Jesus is seated. And again, as I said before, he was mainly speaking to a Jewish audience, a people who didn't really hold the belief that Jesus was the Messiah. And uh, he's basically talking about, he's basically talking about how sin was before Jesus and how it will be after Jesus. He's comparing the two sides, the, the old covenant that God made with his children, which is the covenant that he had with Moses, and the new covenant that now he has when Jesus comes. And verse 1 says, the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow or a dim preview of the good things to come. It wasn't the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. For the worshippers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So he says, well, guys, listen. The old system that you had of the Ten Commandments of the Levitical law was only a shadow of the great things that were to come. It actually wasn't the real thing in itself because the real thing was still to come. So it was only a shadow. You see, if I, if I move my hand, my shadow actually moves his hand. If I start dancing, it actually does the same thing. But you see, if, if, if I start clapping, my shadow does this, ah, you'll find another preacher, I'll be gone straight. Because a shadow is not supposed to do that. It does exactly what I'm doing. So he has explained to them, look, it was only a shadow of what they were doing. The sacrifices which they had to do for their sins, they would take a lamb or a goat or a bull, and then they would kill it and the blood would spill, they would burn it as a sacrifice for their sins, and they did it every other year. Every year, I mean, they did every single year to ask God for forgiveness for all the sins they had committed throughout the year. And he says, well, this really didn't make a difference. It didn't even make a dent in the problem of sin. Because if it did make a dent and it changed, then it means after a few years, these people would be perfect in their worship. So they wouldn't need to come back and have sacrifices for their sins because they've already sacrificed and they learned and they came back. But no, the people would come year after year. And he says, well, the system really didn't work. It was, it was a constant reminder of their sins. We're like, ah, man, we went to 2010, 2011, we're back. Things are tough. You see, they come back, they sacrifice. 2012, again. 2013, again. And you've been doing it for 20 years. You've been sacrificing for sin. So what better are you? You're not improving at all. You're not improving at all. But this reminder of sin is what made them even worse than they were if we say that. Because they even went on to make idols of themselves and worship because they found it so difficult. That honestly, every time we come, we're just reminded of how inadequate 
we are just reminded of our sin, we are just reminded of the wrong things that we do, so nothing is ever changing with us. You see, because he explains it here, he says, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Because goats, bulls, and lambs were animals, and we were humans, imperfect humans. So for us to become perfect again, we needed a perfect human to come, do what we ourselves could never do, so that we would become perfect in God's eyes. That's what he was trying to explain to these guys. So, he's not saying the first law was bad. No, not at all. It was good. But God put it there knowing that it, it actually had its, its inefficiencies because we as people can never be righteous for a long time. We can't do it by ourselves. But it, God put it there so that he could make these people see how much they needed Jesus. See, because they wouldn't accept Jesus to die for their sins and them to be cleansed if they themselves could do it on their own. So God allows them to go through this process where they're learning that, well, I can't really stop lying by myself. I can't really stop watching pornography by myself. I can't really stop doing all these things by myself. So it's only Jesus who can save me. So it wasn't imperfect in that sense, but it was imperfect in, in, a, in a godly kind of plan to show them what they needed in the future. And I'll skip over to 8 and 10. It says, then he said, this is Jesus speaking. Look, I have come to do your will. He's come to do God's Father. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second in effect, which is what I was just talking about. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. Once for, once for, so Jesus only had to do it once because we needed a perfect person to make the perfect people perfect. So Jesus, the perfect, came and did what the imperfect couldn't do so that the imperfect would become perfect. Amen. You see, I, I love the movies of Jesus. And it comes a story about Barabbas. So I was like, when the hell do we need to know about Barabbas? What's the big deal about Barabbas in the story? <laughs> the most outstanding thing happens there. Pilate says, well, guys, today is that holiday again. This is the time where I release the prisoner that you guys want. And he had Jesus on one side and Barabbas on the other side. Barabbas, a murderer, a rapist. He started revolutions against the kingdom of Rome, which was unwanted at the time. He was the worst of the worst. He used to kill grandmas, he used to hit children, everything raw you can think of. That was Barabbas. He did everything. And there's Barabbas and there's Jesus. And he says, well guys, this is not going to be on my hands, but I'm going to give you guys a choice. Who do you want? Do you want Jesus, who claims he's the son of God, or do you guys want Barabbas, this thief, this robber, this everything, the epitome of everything wrong? Do you want him or do you want Jesus? Because when Pilate sees him, he kind of say, well, this guy hasn't done anything wrong. So they'll probably say, what? Jesus. But Pilate thought he had control, but actually God had control of that situation. <laughs> That's why it's included in the Bible. So the people say, we want Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. We don't want Jesus. Give us Barabbas. And so Pilate says, well, it's okay, guys. It's what you guys want. I'm going to give you Barabbas. He gives them Barabbas. But you understand what just happened here? God let Barabbas free. And he, and he left Jesus there to suffer what Barabbas had to suffer himself. So there was a switch here of what I was talking about, the imperfect and the perfect. So God treated Jesus like Barabbas. So God himself could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Man, that is amazing. That is amazing. That's the love that God had. I'll say it again so you guys will remember this. God treated Jesus, like Barabbas, what Barabbas deserved for all his wrongdoings, he treated his son Jesus so that he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. So now God, God is just, now he had a reason to do this because he, he has just proved his justice. The, the law has just swapped hands now. What this guy deserved, he takes it away, he gives it to the other guy. You see, so God is still the judge, and God is still just, because he has punished the wrongdoer. You have to understand that part. God has still punished the wrongdoer. Why? Because there's been a transparency of what these guys did. Barabbas is set free, so Barabbas is now the son of God. Who 
is Barabbas? You are Barabbas. It's you. That's what the story was all about. I didn't get why it had to be in the timeline of Jesus going to the cross. Skip it. We don't care if they chose Barabbas or not. Jesus is going to the cross. Let's celebrate. He's died for us. God includes the story so we could understand what getting perfection from Jesus meant. The undeserving, the undeserving child of God is treated justly with what he didn't deserve for us. He did it all for us. Which is what this told me about. And so Jesus did it once for all. He didn't have to do it over and over again like these guys did every year because he was the perfect person. They didn't use an animal anymore. They used the one perfect son who could do it. So for once and for all, it was all done. Verse 11 says, under the old covenant, the priest stands, notice his position, the priest stands and he ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. <laughs> it's pointless, but he still did it. <laughs> but our high priest, but our high priest, <laughs> he talks about the priest that they had in the old covenant. And now the new covenant says, our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sin. Right? Good for all time. Once and for all. Our high priest, which is Jesus. One day I'll speak about Jesus being the high priest. But he says, Then he sat down. Jesus is seated, which is what we're talking about. Jesus is seated. I said, then he sat down. Why did Jesus sit down? Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. Why did Jesus sit down? He's done. The priest will stand every day because he knows he still has other sacrifices to do. He does, he kills this one, but next, 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 next. Day after day, you, they wouldn't even give him a chair because he's not going to sit. The whole day, they even had time to they say, well, the family of, this, of these people, the priest of this family will come and do this certain period. The priest of this other family will come and do it because it was a never-ending process. You've got thousands, hundreds of thousands of people coming and you only, that's all you're doing. All day. All day. And you're doing something that is not going to eradicate sin. It's just going to work for just that one year. But Jesus comes. Him, our high priest, he offers himself as a sacrifice so that our sins are gone once and for all. God doesn't remember your sins. It's done once and for all. When you say, well, that doesn't make sense. What about my future sins? But let me tell you something. Jesus died for Christians who didn't even know they were going to become Christians. Which is us. Which is us. So even what you're going to do after you leave this place, it's done once and for all. Then now we don't have to feel like we are condemned to go to God. We shouldn't feel that. No. Because we know He's already forgiven us. Even for what we're going to do in the future. He's already done all that God wants is for us to have a relationship with Him. That's all He wants. He has done all of this so we can now come back to a place where we can fellowship with God. The Bible says, for our God is a consuming fire. He cannot stand sin. Believe me, he cannot stand sin. Moses says, God, now can I see your face? Because I think I'm at a higher level of relationship with you now. But God says, no, Moses, you can't see me. You can probably see my back. Why? Because Moses would have been consumed by that fire. If you had seen God. I used to think it was about the glory of God. But it's about God being a consuming fire. Would hate sin. Because Moses himself had sinned. He had killed a man. He was a murderer. So God says, no Moses, you can't see me now. No. There will come a time when people will see my face. You see, we hear the story about the woman. Who had been in the same state for years. She comes and she touches the robe of Jesus. I used to think it's all about her faith. That's what the lesson was, but it was more than that. You see, they walk and she touches the, the, the hem of Jesus' garment. And Jesus says, someone touched me. And the disciples says, Jesus, that's ridiculous. Why are you making such a big deal about it? Like, look how many people are following us. There are thousands of people. Why do you have to make? And Jesus says, no. Someone touched me. I felt power leaving. So Jesus turned around to this woman. This woman was afraid. Women weren't even allowed to be gathered with there's lots of men like that, just like how the Arabs do it. It was this pretty much the same culture, same area. So she would she was in the wrong place, first of all. Two, she touched a man. You're gonna die for doing such a thing. You could never do that. But she does it. And she's afraid when Jesus looks at her. And Jesus says, No, my child, do not be afraid. 
Because now there's a new covenant. Now you can see my face. And now we're not going to count your sins anymore like what we did with Moses. Moses couldn't see me because he had sin, but now you don't have sin anymore. So now you can see my face. Now we can have communion. Now we can have communion. That's what the story was about. Look at the turnaround. Why is it a big deal that Jesus turned around to find someone that touched him? It's more than that. It's more than that. It's about the new covenant. Now we can come into a place where we can see God face to face. We can come into a place where we can speak to God face to face. We can come to a place where we can hear God face to face. That's what that story was about. The covenant has changed. We're not in a place where we feel condemned to come to God. No. No. God is going to turn his face. He's going to look at us and say, Child, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The faith has made you well. That's what Jesus said. <laughs> but we know that God requires us to have faith in Jesus for us to be saved. That's what the Bible said. So your faith has made you well. Because you have believed in me, it has totally made you clean. So it's okay for you to be here. You've broken all law, but it's okay to be here. Now you can look at my face. Now we can have communion. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. See, if you look at that sentence, it looks kind of wrong. It says, you are forever made perfect. Those who are being made holy, which doesn't, logically, doesn't really make sense. If you're made perfect, then you're not being made to be something else. Because you've already been made. I don't know if you guys are seeing this. Let's read it again. He says, For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. If they're being made perfect, which means they're already holy. So why do we have one being made? Why? See, because Jesus has paid the price, like what he was talking about, he's paid the price, he's done it already. You see, he's made the plan to make us perfect already. So he's seated, he doesn't have to keep standing anymore because it's done. So what we, we are right now, we are people who are being made holy. So we are coming to the workshop to be made perfect. He has the plan on paper. You see, when they're making cars, they just don't start by making the car, they make the plan, oh, this car is going to have like this, it's going to have fog lights, it's going to do this. But that's not the car. They have to come into the workshop and be made into what the plan says, which is exactly what he's talking about here. The plan has already been made. We are made perfect already. So what we have to do is to come to the workshop to be made perfect. You got it. But now, this is the thing. The devil puts it on my mind that we don't have to go to the workshop because we are not needed in the workshop. So we are never made holy because we don't go to the workshop. The plan is there. What it needs for you is to go into the workshop and be made perfect. So when we feel condemned, we are not going to be made perfect because we never went to the workshop. Look, God knows exactly what you're struggling with right now. It doesn't matter you don't tell anyone. God himself knows what you're struggling with. The Bible says, come to me, those who are weary, and I will give you rest. Because we are constantly trying to fix ourselves. Well, if I'm going to go see God, I have to be perfect. I have to make myself perfect. No! If you try to make yourself perfect, you're going to be weary. That's what Jesus was talking about. You're going to be weary because you're trying to do something that you can never do. You see, if you give me an iPhone to try and fix, I am going to struggle because I don't know anything about the inside of that phone. I cannot do it. You see, so no matter how long I try to do it, it's going to be imperfect. I'm going to get frustrated that I'm spending so much time trying to do this, but it's not working. We've all tried that. We've all tried to fix something that never works, and so we get frustrated. Come to me, those who are willing, and I'll give you rest. So you don't have to do it. I'll do it for you. You just rest. People come with, people come with little children, and they come and they run into Jesus, and the disciples are all kicking people. No, don't. Don't go to God. Don't you know He's holy? Don't bring these kids here. He says, no, leave them. Let them come to me. For the kingdom of God is like these. These little children. See, no matter what PJ does, if he gets your laptop and he breaks it, he'll still play with you. He'll still come. He, he's not even bothered about how you feel. But the, the, 
Jesus says the kingdom of God is like these little children. Because he doesn't care. You see, he still comes knowing that you're going to accept him, whether he broke your laptop or whatever, you have to deal with it. So the kingdom of God is like these little children because we have to constantly keep running to God even when we fall. <laughs> That's what he was talking about. We are being made holy. We all have been made it, but we are being made holy. Hebrews 10, 15, 18 says, And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. And then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. That's awesome. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. We're just wasting time if we continue to make sacrifices for something that's already been forgiven. And he says the Holy Spirit testifies of this because it was actually a prophetic word that was in Jeremiah 31, 31. But God says, for I will make a new covenant. I will write, put it in their hearts, put it on their minds, and they shall be my people and I shall be their God. That's what he was talking about here. So, he said the new covenant, <clears throat> I will make of my people on that day, says the Lord, I put my laws in their hearts. Remember that? It's the same word that we were talking about, the laws of Moses. Do not do this, do not do that. Thou shalt not this, thou shalt not that. So he, God says, I shall put them in their heart. I think the Amplified Version says, I shall encounter or encircle it around their heart. You see, have you ever heard someone says, I love you with all my... Yes. I love you with all my... Because that's where we identify with love. So the new covenant that the laws are put in the heart are placed in love itself. We're going to talk about this in, in a couple of scriptures coming. But just to let you know, that's what he was talking about. Their laws are placed in their heart. You see, so now it's not about trying to complete those ten. But when we have love, we complete those ten. You see, here's the thing. It will come, it will come. And when sins have been forgiven, there's no need to offer any more sacrifices. This is the message of condemnation. Right at the top. Satan says, look at your sin. God says, look at my sons. Look at my son. I know you can't do it. Just look at my son. He did it. He did it for you. He did it for you. So don't get locked up. Don't try to feel like you can't come and see me. No. You can't do it. The new covenant. John chapter 14 verse 15 says, If you really love me, you will keep or obey my commandments. There are two things being said here, even though it's one sentence. If you really love me, you will keep or obey my commandments. So Jesus is giving us a key. I don't know if I can simplify this. Okay. If you give me money, I will go and buy you a cup. If you really love me, you will keep my command. What is that saying? Do you want to keep my command? That's great. If you really love me. Okay. You're struggling with something. What's the key? You want to obey God's commandments that say don't do it. If you really love me, you will stop doing that thing. You will keep what I say you've done. Love is our answer to change our ways. But if we feel condemned, we feel like we can't love God and God can love us. So love is taken out of the picture. And then we fail to obey his command because there's no love in it. Okay, let's explain you the scripture. One of the Pharisees was trying to be tricky with Jesus. And he says, teacher, which kind of commandment is great and important? The principal kind, the, the highest level, the most important out of all of them in the Lord. Some commandments are light. Which are heavy? Tell us. And he replied to you, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind or your intellect 
this is the great, the most important principle and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. Notice what Jesus says here. These are very big words. If you look lightly, we won't really understand what this whole part talks about. He says, these two commandments sum up. They put a total and upon them depend all the law and the prophets. Which law and the prophets is he talking about? From the law of Moses going down. It sums up. These two sum up these ten. If you do two, you've done ten. I don't know if you understand the math. Okay. Thou shalt not steal. If you love your neighbor, you won't steal. Because you love them. I don't know if you guys are getting it. Love is the key to being righteous. Love is the key to being holy. You see, I talked about the tree in the middle of the garden. That we don't do things, not only we don't show love by the things we do, by the things that we also don't do. See, but when we begin to not do some of the things, <laughs> we are showing that we love it. It's a sign that we love it. So, for just on the basis that I love Jesus, so I won't do it, we've kept the commandment already. So the key is love. When you say, well, aren't you talking about works if you're saying if I don't do something? Let's look at the words. It says, for faith of the works, it's dead. Because sometimes what makes us fall is the decisions we make and the environments we put ourselves into. Son of David, he tries to stage a war with his father. I think it's in 2 Kings. I can't remember, but it's in 2 Kings. And then they fight a battle in the woods, and he had long hair. And the Bible says there were more people who died because of the environment they were in than the people who were killed by the sword. Because David had such a smaller army than what his son had. You see, so what gave David the advantage is that the environment killed more people than they had to kill. So what kills us most of the time is not because we ourselves can do it, but the environment we put ourselves in. The environment is what kills us. The environment is what kills us. So the action here being talked about is not one about making yourself righteous. But it's the action of just saying, well, I'm not going to go there because I know what I'll end up doing. That's the action. You're not making yourself righteous in any way, but you're just making a decision to watch out for your relationship with God. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father because he has done all the work that needed to be done. Jesus has died for all our sins that we did before, that we are doing now, and that we are going to do in the future. So we don't have to feel condemned to come to God because Jesus has done it all. The Bible said he has done it once and for all. And where there is no sin, there is no need of a sacrifice. So Jesus is seated. He has done his job. It's all done. The Bible also says Jesus is interceded for us whilst he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. The very presence of Jesus seated on the right hand of the Father shows and reminds God that he died for us. So the wrath of God is actually satisfied just by Jesus seating me. That's why we're saying Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. His very presence there speaks for us. You see, in our houses, if we put photo albums, it's not because we're going to forget the people, but we want to constantly remember the times that we had. Jesus sitting there is the same thing as that photo album in our houses. It's a constant reminder to God that, God, these people don't have to go to hell because I died for them. That's why I got the glory and honor from you, because I did what you wanted to do. I have done it all. That's why I'm seated here. I'll give an example of interceding, what interceding actually means. There were two people, two disciples of Jesus. One, his name was Judas Iscariot, and the other was named, the other's name was Simon Peter. They both sinned. They both did something that was wrong. You see, you might say, well, Judas sold Jesus, and Simon Peter denied Jesus. But if you look at the core of what they did, they both denied Jesus. He denied Jesus in selling him, and he denied Jesus in words. So they both denied Jesus. So the same offense that they did. 
Jesus says to Simon Peter, I, I have prayed for you, which means I have interceded for you, that you may not, that, that you may not fail. <laughs> so Judas Iscariot, after noticing that, well, oh, I've denied Jesus, what does he go and do? He goes and he takes his life. And Judas Iscariot does. And the one whom Jesus said, I have interceded for you, stood up in Acts, the Bible says, and he stood up and he says, guys, we are not drunk. We are not. It's the Holy Spirit that has filled us. The same person who denied Jesus now stands and glorifies God and thanks him for the Spirit that he has. He's now standing for God in front of millions of people watching this. What made the difference between the two? One took his life and one ended up standing up for the life, which was Jesus. It was the interceding. That's what made the difference between the two. Jesus only said he interceded for Simon Peter, not for Judas. Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us as we speak right now. Whatever trial you're going to face in future days, Jesus is just praying, why just hold you? And he remembers that if he has faith in you to overwhelm. Jesus is just praying, he's just interceding to God. He's praying to God, God, I just pray for I just pray for this person that whatever trial you face may remember, God, that you are far greater than his problems. God, I just pray that this person, when he sins, he remembers that your grace is, 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 is sufficient for us as you say from Paul. God, I just pray for these people. I just pray for these people. I just pray for these people. I just pray. That's what Jesus is constantly doing. He's seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Even for our sins. God, I died for these people. I died for these people. Jesus is interceding. That's why he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And so now you know why Jesus is seated. You know what he's doing whilst he's seated. The choice is up to yours whether you're going to take your life away from the life. Like what Judas did. Or are you going to be one who is going to accept that life that you have been given. Accept that Jesus is interceding for you as you speak and live to stand for God. Are you going to feel condemned for the rest of your life to the extent that you, you choose to commit suicide, to distance yourself totally from God? Choose to commit suicide and go to hell where there's no God? <laughs> or are you going to be like Simon Peter who stands up and says, Well, I know I denied Jesus. I know I did wrong. But Jesus interceded for me. And I'm going to stand up for Jesus. I'm going to stand up for Jesus. I couldn't help but cry at such a message. <coughs> the love of the Father. If only we could understand the love of the Father, it would totally change how we relate to God, how we see God. We will actually actually begin to see, to highly exalt Jesus as he deserves. Because the, 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 the prostitute, Jesus says, well, guys, this woman loves much because she has been forgiven much. We don't love God much because we actually haven't realized just how much we've been forgiven. I just hope today that as I have spoken to you about how terrible your sins are and how the Father now reacts to the terrible of sins, it's not about you deserve it, but because of His love. It's, it's never been about you. It's always been the love that He had for His child. God is pleased with His Son. If only we could have faith in Jesus. If only we could remember that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. He has done it all. He has done it all. I will still come to church on Sunday, regardless of what happened on Saturday, because I want to be made holy. I want to be made perfect. Because that's what the Word of God said. You see, if I made these words up, maybe you'd go back home and say, oh, that guy's a very good liar. But you have your own Bible. I gave you the scriptures. They were up on the screen. You saw it for yourself. I did not write any of these words. You can double check them for yourself. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. The Lamb of God has been slain to perfect us. If only we could go to the workshop and be made what God has made us to be. Let's not run away like Adam and Eve, you know. Let's remind ourselves that God will still cover us. Our nakedness, God will still cover us. And when He covers <coughs> us, our lives will be changed because of the love we've experienced. Zacchaeus was never the same after he met Jesus. After he experienced the love of the 
father. Because God, God sees the kids up on the tree and he says, come down, we're going to fellowship in your house. He doesn't start saying, well, Jesus, just wait here. Let me go clean up my house so that you can come. He says, come, let's go. Jesus does not preach a word to him, but he stands up and says, guys, if I've ever stolen money from you, or if I've ever done anything wrong to you, I'm going to give you back. He not only does that, but he gives them 400% of what he actually owed. When the law only asked them to give him 100%. He gives 400%. Why does he do such a ridiculous thing after he experienced the love of God? You cannot help it. Your life will never be the same after you experience the love of God. But we will never experience the life of God, if we, the love of God, if we continue to run away from Him. God loves His people. I don't know. I don't know how I could I could explain it in the simplest of terms. But God loves you. Amen. 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 God loves you as His child. He loves you.